All right, welcome everybody. This is uh, one of our installments of our virtual series dedicated to exploring uh, strategic recovery for COVID-19 and really looking at emergent models from around the world. We started earlier in the month with two sessions, part A, and we looked at systemic investing with Climate Kick. We also looked at social capital infrastructure networks with Ashoka and Catalyst 2030. And we're really excited to wrap up the series this week with a session today and tomorrow. Um, today is focused specifically on, on a mission-oriented approach and a multi-stakeholder approach to solving a part of the plastics pandemic. And we're going to learn about that systems approach specifically and how it's been stewarded, planned, and literally how is it going um, as we go through the process. It's not just a roadmap. There's already um, stories to be told, lessons to be learned, and of course a lot of work to be done still ahead. Um, plastics is a huge issue globally. And here out of Bangkok, uh, where I'm based with the regional innovation team, is certainly one of the top critical issues that many are facing. This series is done in collaboration also with our um, UNDP colleagues out of the Istanbul Regional Hub as well. So I just wanted to say from both of uh, the regions, a big thank you for joining us live. And just some, a quick note is if you had any questions throughout any of the discussion of the lightning panel, which we'll start just in a moment, uh, please do share in the chat box. Um, today we have with us Ben Dixon, partner from Systemic IQ. We also have uh, Senderine Van Dijk with NVU. And then certainly uh, on the grounds in Indonesia to share uh, even more uh, is Karana Augustina with the World Resources Institute Policy Specialist. And what we want to also say is that this is a conversation. Um, it's not a formal presentation. So we'll run it like a lightning round. We'll each hear a little bit from our speakers and the, and the stories they have. Um, and then we'll move it to a dialogue. So when we were preparing the session, one of the requests was to make it interesting. And so what that means is we really hope that you are feeling very free to ask any type of critical questions or curiosities or comments and let us know what else is happening. So just want to say thanks again. And without further ado, over to Ben Dixon first. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Courtney. And um, let me just get my screen up. Um, OK, here we go. Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning for those of you on the same side of the planet as me. And uh, good afternoon, good evening for those of you uh, in Asia. Um, well, I, I'll, first of all, I'll just explain who I am and, and who is systemic, and then I will talk uh, in a lightning fashion about the work that we've done in Indonesia on plastics. So uh, my name is Ben Dixon. I'm a partner in a company called Systemic, where I lead our work on uh, the circular economy with a particular focus on plastics over the last uh, few years. Uh, systemic is a B Corp, and what that means is we're a, a private company with a a social and environmental mission. And our mission is to, to catalyze system change uh, across uh, three areas. So across um, regenerative land use and oceans, uh, low carbon energy systems, and uh, materials and the circular economy. Uh, we do this through a portfolio approach. So we have, uh, uh, we carry out analytical research of the type that I'm about to describe. Uh, we run strategy consulting projects uh, we have a venture investment arm and we work on uh, project incubation, uh, venture incubation work. Uh, we're also a proud partner of the UNDP with a program on um, looking at uh, more broadly at the circular economy opportunities in Indonesia. Uh, so perhaps in the future we'll be able to share that in another lightning panel, but not, not for today. Um, so today we're speaking about Indonesia and the, the challenges of uh, plastic waste. Uh, for those of you uh, who need a quick recap, um, Indonesia is a country of uh, around 260 million people living on uh, 17,000 islands. Um, so for those of you who think you have challenges in how do we uh, uh, manage plastic waste, <laughs> you can imagine that this country has, uh, has particular geographic challenges, uh, also exacerbated by the fact that, you know, Indonesia has had a growing economy and that tends to lead to more plastics consumption um, and, uh, and Indonesia has an underdeveloped waste management system. So these factors uh, uh, were, were key in, um, I guess, the conclusions that came from a 2015 study, which said that Indonesia was the second largest source of 
uh, plastic waste in the ocean. Um, and I think we can all say, especially when you see the, the targets, that the government of Indonesia responded uh, extraordinarily to that, to that point. So once the data was out there, um, President Vidodo uh, announced uh, that he would be targeting a 70% reduction uh, in plastic pollution uh, by 2025. Uh, and last year, Indonesia became the first country uh, to be a, a partner of the Global Plastic Action Partnership. And that's how we, uh, we were involved. So the Global Plastic Action Partnership is an initiative that was set up by the World Economic Forum. It's supported by some industry partners and also by uh, some government partners, uh, Canada and the UK. Uh, the uh, Systemic Jakarta team was uh, asked by the Global Plastic Action Partnership to help to set up the first Indonesia National Plastic Action Partnership, which we call the NPAP. And so the job that my team had was to convene a steering board um, together with the World Economic Forum, which was a number of ministers and senior level business representatives and senior level representatives from civil society. We also convened an expert panel uh, of Indonesian academics and practitioners. Um, and we carried out uh, a piece of system modeling research, uh, which I'll explain now. Uh, so this is a lightning panel. And so I won't be talking in great detail about the research that we've done. Uh, for those of you that would like to see this in more detail, um, I think Courtney's already shared some links to the work. And you'll see here that there's a report that was published earlier this year which lays out in quite some detail the analytical research that was carried out and which I'm going to describe very quickly now. So what was the system change scenario and what was the system modeling approach that was carried out for Indonesia? So first of all, we were guided by uh, two big questions. The first big question was, what happens to plastic pollution in Indonesia if we continue on the same trajectory as we're on today. So if we were to just, if we were to say, let's keep the collection rate, so the waste collection rate, the same as it is today, and in the face of a growing population and a growing uh, plastics consumption per capita, even keeping collection rates the same as they are today is quite a big job, you know, it takes, still takes a lot of investment to do that. But if we keep collection the same as, as it is today, we still end up with a doubling, more than a doubling of plastics leakage into the sea, into rivers and into lakes by 2040. The second big question that we were asking was to say, how can it be possible to bring that plastic pollution down to the levels that the president has committed to, to 70% reduction by 2025? And then how can we bring it down to almost zero by 2040. What's, you know, how can we bring it down to very low levels uh, by 2040? And so that was, the guide, that was the second big question that we asked ourselves going into this analysis. Uh, and this page will take a little bit of explanation, so please bear with me. Uh, but in order to answer that second question of saying, you know, what will it take to bring plastic pollution down to low levels and to meet the president's commitment, uh, we used a wedges analysis and what the wedges analysis does on the left hand side it shows the the forward trajectory of what would be the end of life for plastics if we keep going the same way we're going so this is our business as usual scenario and as you can see we would be going from 6.8 million tons of uh, plastic waste generated in 2017 up to nearly 14 million tons in 2040. And we would be continuing with the situation that we currently have, where we have you know, quite low recycling rates, about 10%. We have a large amount of material being disposed uh, into uh, dump sites and landfill facilities and a significant, almost 50% of the material being openly burned. Uh, and the biggest chunk, the, the chunk we're most concerned about, or at least for this analysis, was the, the leakage of plastics into nature. And you can see that that would be growing, as I said previously, doubling um, uh, from about 600,000 tonnes per year in 2017 to uh, more than a million tonnes per year in 2040. So on the right hand side, then we 
we said, how do we change this? How do we change this picture of a continuing worsening problem of plastics uh, by applying a system modeling approach, by, by putting in place a methodology that could rank the different interventions, both on the cost, but also on the viability and on the you know, screening them for other environmental and social cons consequences, such as uh, climate change. So the model that we built allowed us to, to put a different picture, which is the wedges chart we see on the right hand side. Um, and uh, as you can see here, the big thing we've, we've been able to do here is to show how much of that plastic waste generation could be reduced or substituted with other materials. And we're not going to talk in detail about that because we've got Sandarine coming up on the panel to talk about uh, some of the innovations that are needed for us to really build those reduction and substitution wedges. What we're also able to show is a significant growth in the amount of plastics recycling, uh, and that, as well as being a, a you know a positive uh, way of solving you know dealing with waste. It's also a way of generating jobs, um, and we're seeing uh, a kind of still some growth in plastics disposal into landfill facilities or, or, or um, other disposal options. But what you can see is we've built a pathway here which allows us to, to demonstrate what it would take to meet these targets by 2025 uh, and to really eliminate plastic pollution or bring it down to very low levels by 2040. Um, and because it's a lightning panel, I can't tell you all of the other great uh, outcomes that come here, but you can see at the bottom of this page, we've been able to model how much less plastic is going into the sea, how many jobs could be created, what would be the benefits in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions from the overall plastic systems uh, and uh, some qualitative uh, insights into the health benefits of building uh, improved waste and recycling systems. Um, and so I think the last comment I'll make before I hand over to, uh, to Kirana is to say that uh, we call this the system change scenario. Uh, this really, I think, reading a lot of the documents coming into this panel resonates, I think, very well with the work that UNDP is, is, is carrying out and looking at portfolio approaches to system change. Uh, and rather than go through all of the, the, the numbers on here, I'm very happy to come back to these in the discussion. I think the key conclusion that we come up with is to say there is no one solution to plastic pollution. We have put forward five big categories here. And even within those categories, we need experimentation and we need portfolio approaches. But I think the key thing that we've been able to do with the model is to build, uh, a, a, I think, a scenario that demonstrates this is possible if we pull all of the levers we have available all at once. If we, if we stop arguing about, is it this or is it this? If we stop saying, you know, we need to build uh, thousands of incinerators and that will just solve the problem. If we start saying we need to convert everything to compostable plastics and that will solve the problem. What we need to understand is this is a system change that's required. Not one intervention won't do it alone, but we need a portfolio of activities and we need to get on with it. We need to, to start acting. We need to use this scenario as a guide and we need to move into action and learning by doing. Uh, and that that I think that concept of moving quickly into action is something that Kirana will talk about uh, in the next uh, in the next session. So uh, I'm very happy to come back to any of these points. Uh, I think I'll stop the, the initial presentation now and hand over to the next panelist. Uh, Courtney, is that all right with you? Perfect. Thanks so much, Ben. And just a quick reminder to everyone: please feel free to enter your you know questions in the in the chat box. But we'll go over to Kirana Augustina, um, who can share a little bit more about what this is all looking like in action. Um, so thanks so much, Ben, for painting a bit of the you know the the architecture of the design. And of course, we you, we have many more stories to tell in terms of implementation. But Kirana will share a little bit further um, of some of those e examples. So Kirana, over to you. Thanks, Courtney. So let me share screen my slides. Hope everyone can see now. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, my name is Kirana, and I'm uh, working at uh, Ellen Pub Secretariat at WRI Indonesia. And today, uh, I'd like to share about uh, the platform, this platform, how NPAP uh, could support the Indonesian Ocean Policy that Ben was just mentioned. Uh, 
So just a little bit context about the plastic action in Indonesia. Um, so all over the world, uh, basically we are facing the plastic pollution crisis, including Indo a country such as Indonesia, which is the largest archipelagic nation in the world, where 60% of the population actually reside in the coastlines. And uh, Ben was exactly uh, perfectly mentioned about uh, the archipelagic uh, geography about Indonesia and and exactly to respond to this, the government of Indonesia creating what they call the Indonesian plan of action and established the presidential decree as well uh, to which is a bold commitment and very ambitious in reducing 70% of the plastic pollution by 2025. So the government of Indonesia also creating uh, the, what they call the task force of ministers. Uh, there are 16 ministers and or 16 ministry under this action plan uh, working to, towards this, these goals. Uh, but there's also the needs uh, to support uh, on uh, the multi-stakeholder uh, platform. So the GPAP or Global Plastic Action Partnership, um, they're there to really accelerating these goals. So uh, NPAP is actually the public-private collaboration uh, that really hope to be the neutral platform that brings all, all the key stakeholder into these, uh, this uh, discussion. Um, and NPAP itself uh, follow the GPAP model and there's the three main impact actually, actually but it's really uh, the, work, the work that Systemic has done to creating a new insight of uh, what is really happening in Indonesia is also one of the key impact that then will be uh, driving uh, the policy to the Indonesia and how uh, can, we can unlock the financing and uh, also uh, changing the behaviors. The other important uh, role is harmonizing the metrics because um, as we all know that uh, the goal is clear, 70% reduction by 2025 and there are several uh, baseline. Uh, so another impact that MPAP will bring to the table is how we can have uh, one language to to the methodology, how we uh, how we tracking the progress uh, of this as of this uh, process, and how we achieve this target uh, of the seventy percent reduction by twenty twenty five. So, uh, and then uh, what uh, NPAP is doing? Uh, so, in two thousand nineteen, we established uh, the the NPAP, uh, and then. Uh, after, in one year, uh, NPAP uh, doing the baseline study, uh, which is then exactly by systemic, very comprehensive and costed analysis. This is the first, uh, uh, the first study that also comprehensive and costed. Uh, and after this April 2020, uh, then NPAP starting began the implementation stage. So as we can see, uh, Another role of the NPAP is to really convene the key partners uh, that working on the plastic issue. Uh, at the global level, uh, we have a global steering board uh, responsible for global coordination. Uh, the main funders are, are actually the UK government, Canada government, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, and Dow. Uh, and then uh, at the national level, we have uh, ambassador, uh, Minister Luhut, which is uh, the, the his ministries is also become the lead agency for the, uh, the the national goals, our presidential decree as well. And uh, we have NPAP steering board. Uh, we have the chair uh, that aligning the coordination between uh, our steering board members, uh, which is diverse bit, uh, amongst the uh, like diplomatic missions such as Canada, UK government, uh, Norway government and then the most uh, the and then private sector or industry such as Indofood, uh, MAP, uh, Coca-Cola, Nestle, and also uh, civil society such as Nahdlatul Ulama, uh, like religious uh, body uh, and as Alliance Zero Waste of Indonesia. And uh, after uh, as per November 2020. Uh, 
WRI Indonesia, uh, working toward uh, working as uh, taking its role as an NPAP secretariat after uh, systemic um, to to work on the daily basis uh, to deliver the NPAP activities, which is the key me delivery mechanism of GPAP as well. And uh, we all agree that we need a task force. Uh, so these five task force are really the change maker or agent of change that working to implementing the multi-stakeholder action plan. Uh, and we have a five task force, uh, which consists of policy, innovation, uh, financing, uh, behavior change, and then uh, matrix, which uh, then follow with the key uh, five pillars to reduce, uh, to substitute, to double collection, to uh, build the safely dispose, and to increase the recycle rates. And um, we're, we are know that um, the, this multi-stakeholder action plans uh, requires a billion of, of funds. Uh, so the financing tax force is the first uh, tax force that we are setting up. Uh, in all five, in all tax force, uh, the co-chairs are combined between uh, state actor and non-state actor. Uh, all the co-chairs coming from the government side is also uh, leading at the uh, minister tax force. So we are trying to really harmonizing and align with the with the national uh, work and targets. And from the private sector, it's combined. So for the for the financing tax force, we have uh, Asian Development Bank and the Ministry of Finance, and um, so we have uh, 16 members at the moment working uh, for the financing tax force from the government of Canada, UK, uh, Denmark, uh, and all of these. Uh, now we're working together to reshape, to shaping the the financing road, roadmap that we are hoping to to launch. Uh, in the end of September during the Sustainable SDI Impact Summit at the World Economic Forum. Um, so uh, NPAP also trying to be really uh, inclusive and uh, we are adapting to the COVID uh, and these are just uh, to show how NPAP trying to support mechanism of the COVID as well. Uh, we are supporting the informal sector uh, and gender. We are also just working on a gender strategy and all the task forces. Also, uh, we have gender specialists that now working to mainstreaming uh, the gender issue under the, all the five task force, as well as the NPAP action plan, just to make sure there's a gender balance. Uh, we support all the marginal uh, communities, such as the informal sector, and and also uh, for the medium term opportunities, we are now uh, working with the financing task force and innovation task force, as well as matrix to survey, like the so we are creating now what we call solution portfolio, uh, because another impact that uh, NPAP or GPAP trying to aim to make is to matchmaking, uh, like matchmaking the uh, impactful solution with the right resources. So we are uh, currently doing the survey, uh, uh, talking with our members uh, about uh, from the financing side, what kind of funds they have, and from the uh, members who have impactful project, we also uh, now interviewing how how then we can make ma uh, match making between between those two. And uh, on the right side, you can see this is the journey toward improving the financing ecosystem. And uh, this year, the strategies is really to set the clear targets, translating what systemic has been done, like uh, in the multi-stakeholder action plan into more concrete roadmap among the five task forces. Uh, and inside the task forces, we are also trying to find the quick wins, like uh, 90 days days after this and after this task force uh, established and then after one year so we can like celebrate every wins and and also uh, we know five, 2025 is very close like uh, less than five years so uh, that's why we are now in uh, it, despite this cost fit uh, we keep uh, uh, we keep trying to maintain our momentum and uh, to build the coalition and then create the financing package altogether, as well as uh, hopefully 
after 2021, we can see the result of uh, all the roadmap under the five task force uh, uh, launch, and uh, we can we can have the pilot site and work together. So I think that's all about uh, the enlightening uh, session from NPAP. Uh, so if you wish to work together, if, uh, please feel free to contact me. Thank you so much, Sandrine. Back over to you. And happy to answer any questions about NPAP. Great, thanks everybody. And just again, quick reminder, we did put the link to the MPAP uh, report that's very comprehensive um, in the in the chat box. But um, we wanted to hear a little bit about the mechanics, so Kirana was walking us through that. And now we're going to segue over to um, a little bit about what does this also look like from um, the engagement of private sector and civil society too, both upstream and downstream. So over to you, Sandrine, to, to share a little bit of some of these living examples uh, and case studies that are emerging. Yeah, thank you, Courtney, and thank you, Karana, Ben, for the first introductions. Um, let me just pull up my uh, my slides here. So uh, my name is uh, Sandrine van Odijk. I'm based in the Netherlands, uh, and uh, I work for an organization called NVU. Um, we are a venture builder for impact ventures, basically uh, steer towards towards uh, really creating system change on a num number of domains, including uh, agri-food, uh, circular economy, um, and financial inclusion. And we work across the world in a couple of different countries. Um, and it's particularly in, in, in Asia, we have an office in India and, and in Indonesia. And that's what I'm going to briefly share something about uh, on how we, from our Indonesia office and our Zero Waste Living Lab program, are building upstream solution ventures, how we call them. So basically new business models and new ventures that tackle the plastic pollution crisis um, upstream in the sense, well, I'll get back to it in a minute, but really like uh, uh, in the wedge that uh, Ben just showed in the, on the level of re reduction and substitution. So really trying to eliminate uh, single use plastics that are very difficult to collect or recycle. Um, yeah, so um, that's that's basically like uh, the starting point from for us is that we saw that the, the plastic crisis was only getting worse. This is global data, but of course, Ben already showed some very country specific data for Indonesia. Um, this crisis is, is, is growing and uh, in a business as usual scenario, even even with um, uh, increased recycling and collection, uh, we will still be faced with a lot of leakage into the ocean. And in, in, in Indonesia in particular, it's two times uh, the amounts of volumes that we see now. So it's really very significant. So for us, it became very clear that if we don't do anything uh, on the side of reduction, uh, we are not going to tackle this crisis. And one of the reasons why we dove into this uh, topic of reduction with our zero waste uh, living lab uh, is because we see that uh, it's it's in a, in a way a different solution area. So I totally agree with Ben that we need a systems approach to solving uh, the plastic crisis. But if you look at the solutions that are being that are out there on the market and and, and put forward by NGOs and partnerships, uh, I would say almost 80% focuses on the downstream solutions of of collection, recycling, cleanup, ocean cleanup, these type of things. And I would, I would typically categorize those as, as quite incremental change uh, from the current traditional linear business models. And uh, on the reduction and substitution side, it actually requires a lot more change, uh, change in, the, in the value chains of big brands, how they deliver products to consumers, how they package these products. And so that's really quite a bit more disruptive. And uh, with disruption and, and, and uh, this more challenging innovation comes a lot more risk. So that's also what we see in the market, that there's simply not enough investable, bankable solutions upstream uh, to make that wedge uh, possible. So that's really why with the Zero Waste Living Lab and our venture building approach, we are focusing on building those upstream uh, ventures. And so how, how we do that uh, is, is really also by taking a systems approach. So we, we basically build forth on a lot of the knowledge that groups like Systemic have developed on what are the strategic intervention points, what is really needed. 
Um, and then we uh, and then we do also our own analysis of specific markets. So we really dive into the, the to-go market, into the supermarkets, into the local value change for food and and uh, other types of con consumable products that are sold in small mom and pop shops, for example. And we look at okay, where are the potential the low hanging fruits to start redesigning these supply chains and really start to look at how can we bring products to people without necessarily wrapping them into a packaging that is completely not recyclable. So just think about a sachet multi-layer format, which is very abundant in many of the Southeast Asian countries, um, has no viable end of life scenario. So actually the only pathway forward there is to look at can we reduce or substitute this material in a, in a way. And so that's really what we what we do. We look at um, building those new business models. We we uh, ideate them, use human centered design techniques to test them uh, together with local consumers, of course, in real life settings and start piloting the business models until we find a sort of product market fit. Um, and then what we also do is to really work together with FMCGs and brand owners to, sh to make sure that those type of solutions are not going to be left in a vacuum of some sort of zero waste niche for the upper, upper class consumers, but that uh, we can really make them uh, accessible uh, for, for the big markets. So we work together with partners like Procter & Gamble and Alpla, who are really large players uh, and have a wide portfolio of products that they put out on the markets in, in, in Indonesia. And then also we, we work together with governments and NGOs, and that's why we're a very proud member of NPEP as well, to start to look at what would be the new types of uh, regulations and policies that need to be in place to create a level playing field for those types of upstream innovations that are uh, a lot more disruptive than, than traditional. And there might also, of course, be pushback from, from companies, uh, although we start to see more and more that the whole scene is starting to, um, including brand owners, is starting to look for alternatives also upstream uh, in the solution space. So just to give you a brief illustration of what we're currently doing. So at the moment we are piloting and scaling six innovative business models that we have uh, developed. And some are, are, were ideated and developed by our own team and are built by our own team in Indonesia. Others we, we do together in a joint venture with existing Indonesian entrepreneurs. And they range from, from for example, KCP on the left, uh, a fully reusable and circular e-commerce platform that's, that directly links farmers and consumers and delivers all the fresh fruits and vegetables uh, without any single-use plastics involved. So every, everything comes in reusable crates. Uh, all the way up to a coin pack um, that you see on the right, which is a, uh, a sort of a platform as well based on uh, refill and reuse systems. We use reusable sachets, but also reusable uh, bottles uh, that can uh, serve as a replacement for those sachets that I already mentioned. And we have a lot of smart technology integrated here uh, to make sure that people get the right incentives, consumers are incentivized to buy this instead of the sachets, but also that corporates can get really relevant market data out of the sales they do in these local war rooms. So this is, a, and then we have some more examples in the hospitality sector, for example, or in the to-go industry with Kapkita. Um, very briefly on, on, on uh, to dive into how then do we do this? So for example, with CoinPack, we are really looking at reinventing the business model and the supply chain. So for example, if you imagine a Procter & Gamble shampoo product, normally the, the brand would produce it somewhere, uh, package it, bring it to the wholesale middleman where room consumers, and then it's up to the consumer to let the packaging get lost. Um, and, and we know in Indonesia then that uh, only a small percentage is recycled and a lot of it is polluting the environment. So in the future, uh, CoinPack's business model basically allows an, a brand owner, an FMCG, to use a packaging as a service uh, where the packaging is used to, to bring the product to the room and the consumer. And from there, uh, the packaging is then again collected, cleaned, uh, refilled and redistributed. And that's, that's a model that we can make work commercially viable as well. 
um, and that we are currently uh, testing and piloting in Indonesia in the small uh, small shops. So that's what you see here, some pictures of. Um, and the interesting thing is that this is, of course, very, very local level type of work, right? We work with a couple of those shops and we really test different types of models, different incentive schemes, different digital payment methods. And this is really the type of prototyping that I think we need a lot, a lot more of. It requires uh, some uh, willingness to take risk, uh, to dare to make bold moves. Uh, and luckily, we start to see more and more brands who are interested to join us in these endeavors so that we can really ultimately connect this bottom up innovation work with the ultimate uh, bigger global supply chains that, that, really, uh, that we really need to integrate to start to make a, a, a difference. So, um, yeah, with that, I would like to leave you for now. Um, uh, of course, happy to answer any further questions uh, later on. And there's some contact details here as well. Uh, if you're uh, if you're interested uh, to hear more, thank you. Over to you, Courtney. Great, thank you so much, and big thanks to everyone that's uh, with us live now. We have a few interesting questions popping up, and so what I'm going to do is just uh, string together a few different ones, and then we can answer that first round, so to speak. So thanks for people have been parking some of their um, experiences of of what they're working on in India, for example, over here with Smera. But um, what I would like to do first is, is kind of go back to the systems approach piece and the architecture behind that that Ben uh, walked us through at the very beginning. And so what we see, and it's very well documented, at least from some of the links that we've been sharing, is that you started with um, a lot of, let's say, research, literally the data and the evidence more or less informing the direction that you want to be forecasting possible scenarios and then also better understanding and identifying, I guess, leverage points, right? The top priority elements of what you would try to influence in the system. So one of the questions that has come up um, is around how did you, when you were looking at this data, and, and I think you responded to one of the questions already in the chat box, literally, what is the, the recycling rate, for example, in Indonesia? And you said, well, here's the rough estimate. So one of the questions is, you know, when you're building this database and it's quite significant because it's it's uh indonesia it's it's large and it's complex um was there a what was your approach was it primarily field and desk research was there an experimental element that had lots of feedback loops um what did you find to be the most um you know efficient or effective way in which you were going about it and any lessons learned and and so i just remind if you just joined us um you know ben did ask for us to make this a, a interesting session and, and feel free to challenge and and ask the tougher questions so that's one of the things and then um related to one of the questions so i'm going to ask these two to ben first um i think over here we've got a question from steven which is talking about um the plastic industry and literally when we talk about circular design and and possible um resources and materials that could be substitutes now that you you're coming with a systems lens so there can be unintended consequences of substitution or using different types of materials so he was bringing up for example um could using certain natural packaging or things of that nature actually have more of a, a negative impact on the ecosystem like exacerbating deforestation or depleting certain types of resources if we're looking at um using those eco materials so over to you ben to help us understand the the background of how you um built the research and evidence database, and then a little bit around how you're thinking of managing these possible scenarios with, with different uh, consequences that may not see so, seem so evident at first. Yeah, cool. uh, thanks, Courtney, and uh, thanks for the great questions. This is, I, love, I love this kind of a discussion when the questions really get to the heart of the challenges that we were facing. So it tells us that we've got a very informed audience here. Um, the first question was to, was to say, how on earth do you build a system model based on every, what I think probably everybody on the call knows is waste management data is a disaster. I think this is something that everyone in the waste management industry talks about. Uh, we, I think we all understand that this is a, top, this is a, a sector that really has poor data. Um, and so building this kind of a model on the basis of uh, very poor primary data is a big challenge. Um, and so the approach that we've taken there is, is two things. Firstly, uh, we have, uh, we built a data vacuum uh, or Hoover, we call it in my country. And so we had a team of people who, who basically pulled in every single piece of primary data that we could possibly get our hands on. Uh, worked very closely with the Indonesian government who I think actually have been doing some really good work to improve the quality of data, uh, NGOs, 
practitioners, uh, you know, uh, everybody we could find, we built this vacuum. So we pulled in every single piece of data. Uh, and then, of course, the challenge is it doesn't always add up. You know, it's very hard to kind of compare some sources because they're using different methodologies. But I think the advantage of having a lot of data is that it allowed us to to really sort through that and figure out which, you know, what would be the the best estimates and the best ranges that we could find in that in that source in that primary data set. I think the second thing that we did was we we put together an expert panel, and so we brought together the best academics practitioners. And we use this group as our brain to help us interpret this, this data. So I think by the end of that process, we felt pretty confident that we had, A, we got all of the data that was available, but B, we had this very diverse brain of, of individuals to help us interpret it and help us guide us, you know, using their decades of experience in terms of what, what would be, you know, the right interpretation of the data that we've got. And I think the last thing to say is it, the, the work that we've done doesn't need perfect data. Um, and the whole um, objective of this is not to come up with the perfect and only scenario for how to solve plastic pollution, but it's to build a consensus based model of saying, how could we do this? Uh, let's give us enough shape of a solution that we can get on and start to act and move ourselves out of this kind of paralysis mode of uh, anal anal paralysis by analysis let's get into action mode and i believe that that's what we were able to do with the with the work that we did uh, the second question you asked was about unintended consequences and believe me uh, having an expert panel is great but sometimes they torture you uh, and this was one of the topics where they really tortured us so they said you know you're coming to us with some global methodologies talking about how it's possible to substitute from plastic materials for certain applications and certain uses you could substitute with some types of compostable materials and some types of fiber based materials a paper cardboard similar things like that now what we were tortured with was to say surely that has an impact uh, if you're going to radically increase the amount of paper that's being used for packaging then you uh, you're risking uh, deforestation, potentially climate impacts if that uh, material has a you know worse life cycle assessment uh, than, than plastics. So we went through a whole lot of analysis, particularly in the Indonesian context, to say you know we have a methodology here. How can we be confident that um, that we can put put forward a substitution volume that won't lead to those uh, deforestation outcomes? And what you'll see actually is that in Indonesia our model shows a, a, a smaller amount of substitution compared to the global model because of the concerns that we received about, you know, whether Indonesia could scale up paper, sustainable paper production at the same level. So I think it's a great question. Uh, and I think it highlights the fact that we needed a methodology that is robust uh, towards unintended environmental consequences, but also a process that really involves the local Indonesian stakeholders in telling us you know, what's possible in that particular country. And as we roll this out to other countries, that's what we need in every single place. Um, okay, Courtney, hope that answers your question. Yeah, and hopefully maybe opens up even further questions if we, if we double click on it. Um, so yes, please keep the, the questions coming. So the next two I'm gonna uh, string together are actually over possibly to uh, Sandarin in Kirana. And one is from one of our colleagues in Nepal, and it's really something very relevant. I think a lot of our teams specifically are looking at behavioral insights as a really critical element to um, addressing an effective type of response or, or building an effective type of response. And I noticed, for example, um, part of your, your construct included hiring people with expertise in behavioral insights. And so if you could maybe walk us through some of your um, you know, examples of how some of your interventions have been inspired by that It'd be very interesting for us to learn from that experience and then equally so from uh, Christine here Christine Berg was mentioning around um, you know when you're looking at the informal sector which is so critically uh, in, in significantly a part of this uh, dynamic if you will around uh, waste plastics etc and um, Although it's, it's recognized part of the waste collection and handling, what is your perspective on relying on the work of people who have um, no workers' rights, maybe risk their health without wages that give opportunity to better their situation? And, and also another thing that we also, I think, uh, have observed in a variety of contexts is that younger generation doesn't, they have an aversion to working in this kind of uh, segment. So 
how might uh, behavioral insights play a role? How are you thinking of it systematically in terms of integrating that into your um, suite of interventions? And then what are some of the observations you've noticed of, of how you're dealing with that? So um, maybe over to any of you, but I think uh, given that uh, Sendering, you're also working kind of at a, at a very granular level uh, on the ground with uh, small mom and pop shops, as you mentioned, maybe you have some things to mention as well as uh, Kirana in terms of just looking at that really robust uh, group of people that you've put together to kind of deliver on this. Yeah, thank you, Courtney, uh, and, and thanks for the great questions. I think for, for me, the first question, uh, let me start, start there uh, using behavioral insights and how can you sort of get people better on board on the mission that you're setting out as a government or as any organization. Um, I, I, w one of the things that I find really fascinating about using techniques like human-centered design and, and lean startup and rapid pro prototyping is that you actually find a way to start developing the types of solutions together with potential consumers. And so actually, in my mind, I'm not thinking about uh, we need to change the behavior of consumers. No, we need to find a, a business model and a product and a service that actually is so appealing and desirable for them that they just want it. So I think that's really an, a, a way uh, to think about it. Like how can you create solutions that people actually really want? And that's not easy um, and it requires a lot of experimentation, but in my mind, we're, we're not working really on like, of course the behavior change will follow after that, um, but it's not an explicit goal to work on like changing people's behavior through like a different narrative. No, it's really like getting them to buy different things and buy their shampoo, not in a sachet, but in a reusable bottle, for example. So that, that I find a, a fascinating sort of intervention approach to um, get people on, on board on your mission. Uh, we don't work uh, directly with waste, uh, waste pickers and, and, and the scene um, there. So maybe Karana can say a little bit more on, on how, um, on, on those types of questions. Kirana, over to you if you if you yes. would like to respond. Thank you, Courtney, and thanks, uh, Sandrine. Uh, at the NPAP itself, uh, in regards to advocacy and behavior change, we all know that everyone has different agenda, but the goals is the same to support the national target in reducing 70% of uh, plastic pollution by 2025. So we focus on that goals and and NPAP. Uh, role is clear to support this national target and then uh, I think uh, during the discussion what we are trying during the approach is also to realize that this is also human connection and then uh, we want to be all the good citizen so uh, having that philosophy or uh, uh, approach is also how we approach this uh, talking with the government talking with the private sector and industry and uh, also civil society and uh, from the government side, we are, we are trying to highlight that we are here definitely to support this national target. Talking with the private sector industry, uh, with the support of the World Economic Forum at the global level as well. Uh, there's also, we're trying to also, there's a approach at the global, uh, global targets because most of the private sector uh, in Indonesia under NPAP as well has relation with the global target such as Nestle. They want to achieve their target by 2025. All their material need to be recyclable. Uh, so it also align with their uh, their their uh, their company in Indonesia. It's also the same with Coca-Cola and uh, in Unilever they have a global target like um, to be like plastic neutral or climate neutral, something like that. So we are trying to harmonizing all these, uh, these, 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 uh, harm yeah, these goals as well. And we talk about with the uh, civil society such as Nahdlatul Ulama, which is the large, one of the two largest religion bodies in Indonesia. We talk with uh, in, uh, with uh, EP, like uh, Association of West Speaker in Indonesia, especially uh, during this COVID, how they are experiencing. This, this crisis and yeah, I think uh, how we approach that, we, we talk with, with, with these different uh, diverse members that we have at the NPAP and, and then we're trying to highlight this. This is actually to support these national goals and we, we all want to be the good citizen uh, and then let's, let's achieve this together. Yeah, and 
I hope this answer the, the question on the behavior change advocacy side. Thanks for yeah. Thanks for sharing some of that perspective. And Ben, maybe you had did you have anything you wanted to add as well um, to that question specifically around either working with the informal segments or uh, the behavioral insights element. Uh, I, I, um, I, I can do, I type something into the chat here. I think this question about the role of the informal sector in the transition and the, the transformation that we need to see uh, is a huge question. I think particularly for the people on this call, it, it's perhaps one of the biggest questions that, that we, we need to answer. We definitely can't do it justice in this call. I'd be more than happy to, to follow up with anybody that wants to talk about how we considered that in the, in the modeling and the research that we did uh, I think what I would say was that we thought it was extremely important to have their voice at the table. And so the Indonesia Waste Picker Association, IPI, was involved in the research. Uh, and I think that was a big step. And I think they continue to be a, a partner for Kirana as well. Um, and I think just having their voice and their representation is, uh, is, is very important. But there's much more that we could say. I probably can't do it justice now. But I think it's a, a huge question uh, that needs to be tackled as we move forwards. Sounds like a follow-up webinar shall happen. Um, so Ben, while, while we have you here as well, one of the questions coming in, and this is very you know, relevant to the theme as well of the, of the series here this August around also funding for systems change. So um, this one is from Giulio Quagiato, and just curious to know if um, your experience around um, you know, making the, 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 the pitch, if you will, right? So raising uh, fund, our funders open to the idea of uh, funding for the transformation of a whole system versus uh, using this portfolio logic or um, are you noticing any kind of difference from that than say individual projects? And I know you just uh, answered it, literally typed it right when I was asking. Yeah, yeah, but, but, but I'll, 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 say, I'll, I'll say something and then Sandrine, I'm going to come over to, to you, uh, warning. Uh, I think the, um, it's a great question. Uh, so our, our funders uh, funding system change approaches uh, with multiple interventions in a portfolio or are they working on project by project? Uh, I think the first thing is funders are really stepping up on this issue and so uh, I think it's compared to a couple of years ago uh, there's huge uh, energy from the funding community of all sorts of different shades of funding now to, to be involved in this. People really recognizing the need and also the opportunity to, to drive system change. Um, but I think the critical thing here is most of the money still is going to downstream approaches. So waste management solutions, recycling solutions. And of course we need that, but I think the balance is, is out because I think it's for, for Sandrine who's working on you know, the upstream questions of how do we get products to people without plastic or with less plastic? How do we redesign our you know, business models uh, for, uh, for the future? Um, I think funding is much harder to come by. So uh, I think there is uh, a great step up from the funding community, but I think uh, I would encourage people to look beyond just the downstream uh, solutions here, but also looking at reduction and substitution. Uh, Sandrine, uh, do you agree with that? Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, Ben, thanks. Uh, thanks for mentioning that. I think that's absolutely true. And uh, that's what we experience as well. Uh, most of our work currently is funded by philanthropies, to be honest. Uh, philanthropies and funders who are who are actually thinking quite uh, um, sort of front front running um, uh, but it's I see that many investors uh, traditional investors but even impact investors are, are a little bit scared and, and and this is again where I come back to the sort of risk aversion um, many of the sort of downstream models like if you think about what the ocean cleanup is doing they can prove how much uh, plastic they can get out of the ocean with their technology uh, from our perspective, it's, it's, it's a lot more challenging to prove that your model is going to be innovated and, and will work for X amount of, of uh, tons of, of packaging avoided, for example, because uh, there's a lot more experimentation required to, to start redesigning these supply chains. So uh, risk averse investors are more tempted downstream. And so I think uh, this really requires some more coordinated efforts. And, and that's why we're very grateful for the partners we already have in Indonesia and are now looking for new partners also to expand these types of efforts to other countries uh, in the region um, so that we can really start to build these types of uh, ultimately quite investable and, and potentially also profitable uh, solutions more upstream. Okay, Back great. Yeah, thanks. So I know we're heading towards the bottom of the hour and um, 
And one of the things that I think I would be remiss to not bring up if, if, if I wasn't moderator um, is really around some of the maybe learnings and lessons that you've drawn from certain possible spaces where there hasn't been traction or possible ways reframing failure, but things that you've been iterating and testing along the way that um, you could learn from and, and share with us your, your lessons learned along the way. Uh, Courtney, uh, sorry, that I just lost a, uh, a bit of the audio. Would you mind asking the question again? Sorry. Yeah, sure. So we just wanted to take a quick pause to see if there's any kind of lessons learned that we could extract from your experience, because in many ways you're doing some pretty unprecedented work that uh, some of us are looking to model uh, the ways that we're approaching what we do by. So if there's um, any kind of, um, you know, top tips or lessons learned from, you know, literally trying to pull, as you said, many levers at one time together. Um, and what are we learning along the way? So yeah, the question is specific to kind of, uh, yeah, what you're, what you're learning as you go. Okay, would you like me to go first, Courtney? Yeah, I think we'll just, we'll go down the line and then I'll, and then yeah. we'll wrap with uh, your final takeaway thoughts for us. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I think um, the three things that are, kind of central to the work that's happening with the Global Plastic Action Partnership and with NPAP in Indonesia. Uh, and I think the magic is getting these three things working together. So the first one is uh, convening. And so the World Economic Forum who set up this GPAP thing, they're very good at this, right? And they were able to bring together ministers together with CEOs of the, the country uh, organizations in Indonesia and civil society leaders and convene that group for the first time to talk in a measured and evidence-based way about plastics and what we're going to do. So, that, so convening is huge here, and I think um, that's that's crucial. But convening on its own doesn't help. Uh, the second pillar is about analysis and really understanding the problem and building, I think, a shared vision of how do we get out of this mess. Uh, on plastics, we could be talking about other, uh, other challenges that we're facing in society. And then I think the, the third pillar, so we're doing convening, we have an analysis so that our work is really driven by evidence. And then the third piece is action, because just talking and just analyzing doesn't help us. We need to get on and do. And I am a huge proponent of learning by doing. So I think that the lessons I've taken from this is if we can do convening, analysis and action, and we can bring those things together, then we can really drive some serious change. Uh, and that's what I've taken away from this initiative. Let's hope we can continue to do that. Thanks. Maybe over to Kirana and then Sandarin, if you have anything to share. Okay, thank you, Courtney. And I think Ben has been explained really well about the impact that GPEP and NPEP are trying to make by convening and um, generating the insight on the local context. And really hopefully by, having, by convening and and uh, having the broad and diverse key players member inside this platform, we can then matchmaking and connecting the dots. And what I learned uh, from, from this uh, partnership that uh, the opportunity is there, the funding is there, and uh, there's a lot of initiatives going on in Indonesia actually, but maybe some is not bankable yet, uh, but then with having this platform, then we can connecting all these dots together and really find uh, the most impactful solution, then we hope to match making with the right resources that we have under this platform. Yeah, I think that's, the, that's an the additional point that I learned from this partnership. Yeah, uh, I think th those, uh, those are really excellent responses and I couldn't agree more also with what Ben is saying, the convening, the analysis and the action. Uh, we are, of course, very much on the side of the action, although we, we act on, uh, on, on the analysis. Uh, definitely what I see as an important lesson learned is finding a way to bring sort of very ground uh, uh, grassroots and uh, bottom, sort of bottom up innovation, how to bring it together with uh, the top down supply chains and how they're organized. So I think that sort of integration vertically is very important and relevant to make solutions uh, scale ultimately. Um, and then one uh, final point from my side is, is really there's so much single, single point uh, interventions and, uh, and people are still looking for silver bullets. What if we can find this one material that can make it all 
make the whole problem go away. I really want to to hammer down on the systemics uh, uh, systems approach and systemics approach uh of uh, of taking uh, creating a portfolio and creating a portfolio of solutions and really looking at the whole um area of interventions that are needed all the leverage points that you need to work on to create the system change that you ultimately uh, want to see happen so with those two points uh, yeah i'd like to leave the audience well you couldn't have said it any better this is, this is certainly part of the the, re the discussion that we have coming up over and over again, um, you know, we need to stop looking for systems change unicorns and really acknowledge the reality as, as you have all laid out for us uh, quite clearly, you know, in this case. Um, so really appreciate your time. The last thing I'll just mention is we have a fantastic amount of uh, sharing going on in the chat box. So big appreciation to all of the just comments and, and exchanges of stories and inquiry. We didn't get to every single specific uh, question that came up, but one thing that we'll be doing is a recap uh, post of all of the series of the month. And we're going to pepper in and, and integrate some of these questions. So um, I'll work with our panelists on getting to some of those questions as well. And what I'm just noticing is a big pattern around behavioral um, insights and, you know, almost a human centered approach to really working with communities. So duly noted on, on that critical, uh, say, practice, if you will. And last thing, just to close it up, if there's anything that you would like to leave with us today, um, as speakers to this, you know, diverse audience, obviously it's UNDP plus the ecosystem, um, the sticky takeaway or the thing that, the, the one message that it would be if you haven't said it already, um, you know, this is the, the opportunity to do so before we, we say goodbye. So um, Ben, perhaps over to you, if you have any final words for us. Um, I think, uh, firstly, thank you very much, Courtney. Thanks for the opportunity to share the work with UNDP uh, and, and what it is a really great group of uh, people from around the world. So I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I, I think I, I, I can't really give you a final thought here. Um, if anything, I would go back to my, my previous comment. And I think um, with GPAP um, and, and with other initiatives, there's an opportunity now for other countries to to also get involved with this uh, with this kind of work, uh, and so for anybody who's who's kind of intrigued by what we've presented today, and would like to explore how it could be possible to to you know put in place some similar programs, um, then I think I'd be very happy to to talk and also to put people in touch with uh, with the right people uh, in GPAP and in the World Economic Forum. So uh, you know I think we we really think that this is a, a huge global problem, um, but it's also a solvable problem. And I think if we can get this convening research and action model really flying, then I think we can, we can really start to tackle this uh, and we can live the dream of solving plastic waste in a generation. Uh, so I'd encourage anybody that would like to talk more to get in touch. And thanks, Corny, for the opportunity. Great, thanks so much, Ben. Uh, I have a feeling we, we will continue the conversations. Um, Kirana? Anything that you'd like to leave with us today? Uh, thank you, Courtney. Thank you, everyone, and all UNDP colleagues for this opportunity as well. And just the final uh, remarks that uh, we think that this plastic issue is actually the global problem that actually needs local solution uh, and is including in Indonesia. And we have the platform, we have the action plan, and we what we need is the action. Uh, and then we realize five years is not long enough it's very short so we need to speed up our our work uh, to really achieving that less than five years target and and pub is a platform uh, where all the multi-stakeholders coming together with the same goals really to to support this this national goals and hopefully by the end of 2021 all the five task force with the members inside which is the actors of this of to implementing this action can work all together and hopefully maybe if UNDP colleague or uh, uh, or everyone who, who watched this would like to be part of the actor, the, the change maker uh, to support this, this task force, uh, please feel free to contact me. And we hope uh, NPAP can bring all these uh, different voices into the same the same language to, to find the, 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 to achieve the same target and we will get there, but together. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, Sandrine. 
Yeah, as a final note from my side, uh, anyone who's interested to learn more about, about the work in Indonesia, please uh, reach out. Um, and, and particularly, we are currently expanding our, our types of activities in different regions. So if you're interested, uh, particularly for regions like Malaysia, Vietnam, India, uh, to reach out, uh, please do so. Uh, we're forming strategic partnerships uh, at the moment. So thank you very much for joining today. Great. Thanks so much, everybody. And the follow up will be uh, the recording as, many, as well as the links to everyone that registered. So you'll get an email from me with all the details. Um, and we can certainly share uh, the information to, to access to continue the conversations. So big and yes, yeah. Very quick, I for I miss uh, one point that uh, and under NPAP, actually, we are really now working uh, to for the innov innovative solution. So we are hope we are uh, especially and actually UNDP is very active in Ghana. They're helping us as a judge uh, and shaping the process for the innovative challenge, and really hoping that for this NPAP maybe we can also work together to shaping the innovative challenge for for Indonesia and NPAP. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks everybody. Have a great rest of your your day. Um, where all around the world. And thanks again for joining. And tomorrow we wrap up our last session of the series. If you're not too zoomed out, do join us. Uh, we have a, a professor actually that will be sharing a little bit more about navigating risk and uncertainty. Um, certainly something that I think most of us probably can resonate with quite well. And so that's tomorrow, same time, uh, same place. So thanks again and have a great one. Thanks, Courtney. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Courtney. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.